Hello and welcome to Devs at Home. It's a new webinar series that we're doing. My name's Chris Stewart and I'm an editor at jackcenter.com and I also work on our Jax London and DevOps conferences. Uh, DevOps Home is something new. It's a new format that we've created as a reaction to the current situation with the coronavirus pandemic. And what we're trying is every Tuesday and Thursday around this time, so lunchtime in Europe, uh, we want to bridge the, the social distances uh, and fight against loneliness together with our experts in an interactive session. Um, so today we're supported on the technical side by Maximilian Renza. He's our director who will also help you with technical problems in the chat. Hi, Max. Hello, Chris. And um, yeah, today's session uh, is called The Quest for the Fastest Depo uh, Deployment Time. Uh, presented by DevOpsCon, and it features El Kerbis, Developer Relations at Tilt. Hi, El. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yep, certainly that is can. The, that is the new standard greeting. Uh, in the old <laughs> days, you would say, hi, how are you? And nowadays, you say, hello, can you hear me? <laughs> well, hello, we can hear you. Welcome to uh, Devs at Home. Thank um, you. Would you like to introduce yourself for our audience? Uh, sure. So I, I work with Tilt, we're a company that does uh, tooling for developers uh, running their applications on Kubernetes mostly. Uh, before Tilt, I used to work at Garden and that's a company that does exactly the same thing. Uh, and before that, a long time ago, I had an internship uh, on Kubernetes itself, writing little bits and pieces for kubectl. So if you're working with DevOps, you know what that is. Okay, thank you. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to steal the limelight again for a second uh, and just mention a couple of points. Um, and that's that we've got the chat, uh, which you should be seeing in your sidebar or somewhere on your toolbar. Um, and in the chat, you'll be able to get technical help from Max. Uh, you can also chat with each other, leave some comments. Um, there's also a Q&A option. Um, and if you could leave questions about the talk, in there, then we'll answer these during the talk uh, as we can. Uh, and so that's it from my side. So I'll give El the floor now. Uh, hello, thank you. And let me just share my screen. Um, and that is hard because computers are weird. So can you see, can you see the, the talk here? The, yeah, okay. So the talk is called the quest for the fastest deployment time. And let's talk about the title first. So this is a talk for developers uh, writing applications that run on Kubernetes. So I'm assuming you're not writing operators, CRDs, that kind of thing. I'm assuming you just have your own application for your own company that does whatever your company does. And it happens to run on Kubernetes. Uh, now, the main thing we're going to talk about is development workflows. That is the experience of you, a developer, writing code that's going to run Kubernetes. And a problem with Kubernetes is that it added a, a many, many, many steps in between uh, you changing a line of code and you seeing whether that line of code works, whether it solved the problem, whether that algorithm you're trying out uh, can actually do the job, that kind of thing. It takes a very long time. And you have to build images, you have to push them, you have to apply new manifests uh, before you can get some feedback. And that basically does two things. One is your development uh, takes a lot longer than it used to. And two, you get distracted. Uh, if an image takes a minute to push, by the time it's done, you're already playing with your phone, you forgot the code you're writing uh, and all that kind of stuff. And I find that usually makes developers unhappy. Uh, people prefer to have a very agile experience where they never lose focus and they can, you know, actually feel productive. So the, the best indicator for a healthy development workflow is a short feedback loop. And that's what we're going to try to achieve uh, in this talk. I posted this tweet. Um, when was this? I think there's a date here. Yes, November. So I posted this tweet in November and I asked uh, my followers, uh, how long does it take between you changing a line of code and that change being live and running in your development cluster? And most people said 30 minutes, uh, a bit smaller amount said one minute, and one minute is fine depending on what you're doing. Uh, and a very tiny number of people said two seconds. 
So I'm going to show you today a workflow that's going to take you to the two seconds. And of course, depending on what you're doing, it's going to take more than that. But I'd like to give you the tools to have a development uh, feedback that is in that order of magnitude. So there are three important rules that we need to follow uh, to, to have any chance of achieving this. The first one, the main one, is do not use CI in development. So CI is, uh, CI is a is a type of tool that was made to address a type of problem that is, I would say, strictly production related. When you're testing code out, you, you don't have any of the questions that CI answers. So just don't use it. A lot of people, they try to replicate, oh, I need to develop exactly the way that I push to production. And to some extent, you're right. For some things you do, CI is something you don't need. So don't use CI uh, as part of your development workflow use CI after. So I wrote some code, I checked that it works, I got my feedback, this is ready to push, ready to go to production, then you push it and then CI tests it and there you go. But before that stage, you don't need CI. A second, uh, second thing that I would say is use an MDX tool. MDX stands for uh, Multi-Service Development Experience. I came up with that term and then I talked to everyone in that niche and we all hate it, but it kind of stuck. So there you go. If you have a better name, I'm all ears. So in that's tools like Tilt, that's the company I work for, or Scaffold, uh, that's made by Google, Telepresence by DataWires, probably the, the, one of the first ones on the list to, to come out many years ago. Uh, then there's Garden, where I used to work uh, before. And these are tools that are going to automate um, your development experience. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a second. And then the third rule is use every hack, cheat, and dirty trick in the book to make your development feedback loop uh, faster, because that's going to make a huge difference. You think, you think going down from 30 seconds to one second makes no difference? It does, and it's huge. As a developer, it's huge. So uh, that's our goal. We're going to achieve the, ch the shortest possible feedback loop with an example app that I'm going to show you. Uh, and let's see how to do that. So let me show you the initial setup here. Um, I'm going to show you, um, we're going to use a simple Go app. Uh, so it's all written in Go. And I think that's fitting because it's the language most used on infrastructure projects. It's going to be running on Kubernetes. And I'm going to benchmark this. Um, twice. Every, everything I do, I'm going to benchmark it twice. Once, running locally on my laptop with a microcase cluster. Uh, there are other clusters you could use, like Kind, K3S, Docker for Mac, or anything like that. Uh, and in parallel with that local test, I'm also going to test it on GCP. So that's Google Cloud. So in the end, we're going to have a discussion about what kinds of workflows you should run locally on your laptop, what kinds of workflows you actually need a cluster running on a cloud to, to use as your development cluster. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Tilt setup. So that's the, the automation tool for development workflow. And I'm going to show you some benchmark trickery. So a lot of people go about uh, this kind of exploration thinking, oh, this feels a bit faster. Yeah, this, is, this feels snappy and subjective things like that. Uh, I don't like that. So we're just going to measure things down to the nanosecond. And that's how we're going to do this. Uh, and lastly, this is the repo that you can use to, if you want to look at the app, there's a folder in there called uh, fast and that folder is going to have all the different stages that we're going to discuss in this talk. So let me show you uh, the app that we're going to test. Uh, it's a, it's an image manipulator. So you can uh, submit an image there. Uh, and that's our image. You can add a red filter uh, and you take it to the app again. And if you see now there's only red, there's a glitch filter that's gonna do some um, uh, image glitching to it. So now it looks all weird. And lastly, there is a, a labeler service, service that's gonna detect uh, what objects are in the, in the picture and label them accordingly. This is a uh, machine learning stuff. It takes a bit longer to run. And the result is this. Now, the image is not very good here. We did mostly uh, feature first, polish later approach, and the polish is still uh, lacking. So you can see that we have a person, that's the, the baby that we saw, uh, and a teddy bear. And then there's some numbers underneath showing the probability. This is hard to read. Again, this, this was not made pretty. It's just, uh, I just wanted the features to be there. 
And we're going to use a stripped down version of this uh, app. It's only going to have the glitching service, uh, the storage, and the front end. So that's all that's going to be there for now. And then uh, the benchmarking. <clears throat> the benchmarking is going to be, we're, I'm basically going to pretend to change something on the glitch service, and we're going to benchmark how long it takes from me making a change to the code to that new code being run. Okay, so what does Tilt do here? Uh, oh, and by the way, feel free to ask questions during the talk, and I'm happy to pause and answer your questions uh, as we go. So what's Tilt gonna do here? So every MDX tool, uh, well, not every single one, but most of them, what they do is they watch your code for changes and they rebuild and redeploy as needed. So every time I make a change to my source code, that tool is gonna pick up the fact that I made the change and it's gonna rebuild an image, it's gonna redeploy it to Kubernetes, uh, and then I'm going to have uh, an updated version uh, live on my development cluster. Um, so that's what Tilt's going to do. And then I'm going to add some extra customizations on top of the basic Tilt workflow. Um, and you can, you can then uh, see how those customizations make things faster. And that is the, the main content that I'd like to show you. Um, so just a caveat, this is not a Tilt tutorial. I'm not going to teach you how to use Tilt. This is not the Tilt sales pitch. If you're interested, you can just go on the website. Uh, this workflow uh, probably works with a lot of other MDX tools as well. So I'm not trying to push anything on you. Uh, I'm, I'm mostly showing you interesting concepts to keep in mind when you are trying to optimize your uh, feedback loops. So let's get started uh, and get right into the app. This is the Docker file for my glitch service. As you can see, it's pretty simple. Uh, I didn't even put a version number there or anything, just, just to keep it uh, as bare bones as possible. So I start with an Alpine image for Go, and that is a pretty basic image. If, if you're all doing DevOps, you're familiar with this. Um, then I copy some stuff that I need to copy. I copy my glitch directory, and that is uh, here. And then I build it, and I run the resulting binary. On, on Tilt, the way to automate this, uh, these are all built-in functions. Uh, so I'm gonna have a Docker build function where I'm gonna say, hey, I have a glitch service. It takes this Docker file, it uses these files. Uh, so just build that image for me and then uh, Tilt's gonna do that. KTML is where I tell Tilt, hey, here's all, where all my Kubernetes manifests are. Kate's resource is a function uh, to add some extra functionality. So here, I'm just, I just want to have a port forward to 8080 so that I can access my, my service from outside the cluster. And then local, local resource is a function. These are all built in, by the way. You don't have to code these functions, okay? So local resource is, a, is the way you can use Tilt to run arbitrary commands. So I'm creating a resource called update. And what this, when I call this resource, what happens is it runs this. And this looks very complicated. And what this does is uh, it goes on my, uh, on my main.go file and it adds the timestamp of the current time. So when I say update, it's going to, to put the, the current time when I clicked update uh, here in the source code. When this code runs after I click the button, it's gonna take the current time when the code is running. And then I'm gonna do the difference. So I'm gonna do the difference between changing a line of code and the code being running. And that's gonna tell me the exact time between, as let's say you add a new function or something like that, you save your file, how long does it take between that and that new code being running in your cluster? That's the whole thing we're benchmarking here. Uh, there are different ways to do this. Uh, I have, if you go on the, on the repo that I shared the link, there is the, the fast folder, which is what we're doing here. And then there's the full folder, which is the whole app. And on the full folder, I'm using different methods to do these benchmarks. So you can check that out uh, if you want to, to see other ways of doing this as well. So this is, this is the, most basic, uh, the most basic setup that I just showed you, the tilt file. Uh, I showed you the Docker file. And this is, if you, if you use most MDX tools, this is the default workflow you're gonna end up with. So I'm rebuilding an image, I'm pushing it. Uh, I'm telling Kubernetes, hey, there's this new thing. Can you apply it to my, to my cluster? And let's see how long it takes.
and it took 28 seconds. So it's not terrible. You, you can live with this. Uh, it's not horrible, but we can do better because to me, 30 seconds, I have picked up my phone and I'm on Instagram already. So I don't want that. I did some tests. Um, so to explain these numbers, the three first numbers in every column are three different tests that I did. And the last one is the average. So we're gonna look at the averages and writing on a local cluster, the average was 23 seconds. Uh, the one when I was recording, the, the GIF that you saw uh, took longer because recording you know, makes your computer slower. So that's why this third number on the local cluster is always gonna be a bit higher than the others. Um, so local cluster, 23 seconds on average, remote cluster, one minute. The reason it took a whole minute on the remote cluster is because pushing those images over the internet takes a lot of time. And well, we don't want to have to do all of that, but actually that comes later. The thing that took the longest was downloading the dependencies because every time I change my code, I have to download all the dependencies again because I'm not caching them. So let's see how to fix that. And that's what I just said. So let's try vendoring and see if that makes things better. So to do vendoring, what I need to do is I create a vendor directory locally and I download all my dependencies there. This is very standard with Go. And then when I'm compiling, I tell my compiler, hey, don't download dependencies. There's a folder here with all the stuff that you need. And what this is gonna do is uh, I'm gonna take some time to download dependencies the first time but then every, every time I make a, a change to my code, I don't need to download them again. And if something changes, I can download only the thing that's new. So let's see what that does in practice. Um, and this is the tilt uh, dashboard, by the way. Um, these are all my services. So I have my start service, my Muxer service, which is kind of the front end that I showed you. And then update is that custom resource that whenever I click it, it's gonna update my app. And then I just click this button to do it. So back to the case in point, it took 13 seconds. Um, a lot better than before, uh, but not perfect. So average uh, 12 seconds locally, average 44 seconds running on Google Cloud. So we got a lot better uh, locally, we got somewhat better remotely. And again, the problem remotely is that pushing images remotely takes a lot of time. And that's why this takes so much longer than the local workflow. So let's see what we can do. Uh, before, we, before we talk about pushing images, let's try something other than vendoring. So there are two ways to do vendoring. Well, not vendoring, but there, there are two ways to cache dependencies basically. One is you can vendor them and have them locally. The other is you can, well, let me actually just show you because it's a bit faster. Um, instead of copying a vendor directory into my image, I can copy my dependencies list into my image. I can download those dependencies into my image and then I can copy my stars code on a layer below that on the image. And what that's gonna do is if I change my code here but I don't change my dependencies, all of this is cached uh, in Docker. So it's basically vendoring for free somewhat. Um, so let's see if this works. And let's see what it does. So you can see there's a bunch of stuff cached here. Uh, and by the way, all these benchmarks, all these recordings that I'm showing you is from the second time forward that I deploy things because the first time it does a lot of things for the first time and that's not really relevant when developing because you basically set, set things up once and then when you're writing your code it's not the first time anymore for the rest of the day so I'm not showing you first time deploys I'm showing you second time forward uh, deploys and it took 13999 here I think this is a bit longer than before uh, and on average, it's not. It's a bit faster than before here, a bit faster than before here. So slight improvement, slight improvement. So we would think that using this uh, Docker layer cache uh, is better than vendoring, but there's an issue. If I change, let's say I have one gigabyte of dependencies. Um, and like if you're developing Kubernetes, if you have like a Go, um, Go client, Kubernetes, API machinery, something, something, that's not unreasonable. 
to have a very large amount of dependencies. If I change one dependency with using this method, the whole layer gets invalidated and I need to download all the dependencies again. And that's gonna take a huge amount of time. If I change one dependency and I'm using the vendoring method, that's fine. I can just download the dependency that changed. So it's gonna be individually, it's a lot faster, but as I start changing things, this is gonna be costlier depending on what I'm doing. So that's something to keep in mind. And for this reason, this is what I just said. So for this reason, I'm gonna go with vendoring going forward. But if you know you're not gonna change your dependencies, or if your dependency if your dependencies are very tiny, um, or like if you have a remote development cluster and you're sharing images with others, uh, then maybe using a layer cache is gonna be better. But that's a separate discussion. Let's not go into that now. Um, and thanks to Dave Cheney, uh, who if you're Go, if you are Go developers, you're familiar with him, and he was the one who suggested this approach to me. Um, okay, so moving on. What's something else we can do to make things better? And I went one slide too far. Um, if you Google, oh, how to make my Go binaries more efficient, something, something, blah, blah, blah. If you Google that, you're gonna hear a lot of people telling you to remove debugging artifacts from your binary. And if you don't know what those are, if you use something like GDB or Delve or PDB or, I don't know, I forget the names of all the debuggers, but if you use an actual debugger, um, you need some debugging information in your binary to be able to use a debugger. And that information takes a lot of uh, space. So let's remove that and see if a smaller binary is gonna give me a faster time. The way to do that in Go is pretty simple. I just tell the compiler, hey, get rid of that extra stuff. And that's pretty simple. And the resulting binary is gonna be three megabytes smaller. And let's see if that makes a difference. And we're almost there. Okay, 12 points something something. So this is faster. Um, it's a bit faster. So here we have modest but solid improvement here, modest but solid improvement. So let's do that. Um, unless, basically rule of thumb, unless you're actually using a debugger, um, if you're doing other things or you know you're not gonna use a debugger, just remove debugging artifacts because a smaller binary means a smaller uh, refresh time and that's what we're looking for. So no mystery here, it's just one thing that you should uh, keep in mind to do uh, as you write your code. I'm gonna talk a little bit further down into the talk about removing debugging artifacts, but let's just hold that thought for now and I'll get there soon. Uh, so we've talked about dependency cache. Now let's talk about compiler cache because uh, Go is very efficient in, in its use of a compiler cache. And when I'm compiling something for the first time in an image, I don't have a compiler cache and that's a problem. And if every time I compile, uh, it acts as if it's the first time, like it's doing now because it's building an image from scratch every time, then I'd never have a compiler cache and my compiler time, my compilation time is always longer than it could be. Um, another parenthesis, uh, I'm talking about Go specific things here. Uh, it's very likely that you're not using Go uh, in your company. Uh, so the point here is not so much to pay attention to the Go things, but to pay attention to the thought process of finding things in your language or in your framework or whatever you're using to shave little bits of time off um, of your workflow. So don't get caught up on the Go stuff. Let's just focus on the thought process behind it. Okay, so let's do a compiler cache. Um, and this is a little benchmark of how much better things are when you have a compiler cache. So by running a test compilation locally of my glitch service, without a compiler cache, it took, it took four seconds with a compiler cache, it, took, it was basically instant. So that is very, very, very significant. How do I do that? So I need a compiler cache uh, available somewhere. And then I need to tell my, um, I need to, so I need a compiler cache in the glitch directory. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second. 
And then I need to tell the Go compiler, hey, there's a Go cache here, uh, and you should use this compiler cache instead of wherever is the default. Now, let's take a look at this, and then I'm going to complain a lot. So let's see how long it took. And this is, OK, nine seconds. So as you can see, we're getting a lot faster now. Uh, if you look at benchmarks, the average was 7.7. .7. Locally, the average was 50 remotely, which is intriguing. So we're going to talk about that too. Um, so locally, a lot faster than the initial time. Remotely, not so much. So let's discuss this. A compiler cache is a ton of very small little files. And pushing them over uh, the network to get them to your remote cluster uh, on Google Cloud or whatever, uh, it's a lot of I.O. and that's costly and that takes a lot of time. So maybe this is not the best approach. Locally, this is not the case depending on the local cluster you're using. So with micro uh yes, things got faster. The last time I tried this with Minikube, because Minikube works differently and I.O. is more expensive with Minikube, it took forever, so it was completely not worth it. Uh, but you might be thinking, okay, it's still better here. Can we use this? And again, another uh, item. When I compiled locally to create my initial compiler cache, and then I put that compiler cache in the image, the image did not use it. The compiler just rejected the cache it had there and created a new one. I don't know why, but it was just incompatible. So how, what did I have to do to even test this? I had to build, an, build my image, compile something inside the image, extract the compiler cache from inside the image and put it on localhost. And then the subsequent times I had to inject that separate cache into the image. Uh, and if you're lost by now, it's because yes, this was very complicated, very convoluted. And my point is I don't think the complexity cost of co copying a compiler cache around is worth the trade-off. Now I can explain the details about this if you want, but it's just not worth the complication. So we need to think of a different way to make use of a compiler cache because copying a compiler cache around is a bad idea. Either you're gonna have compatibility problems or you're gonna pay through the nose in terms of the time it takes for all the IO. So what can we do? W what's a way to keep the compiler cache without having to copy it around? And that brings us to another idea. This far, we have been creating a new image every time we make a change to the code. And if the image is small and everything is very optimized, that is fine. But maybe we don't have to. Maybe we can keep, we can build an image the first time. And whenever we make changes for our code, we keep that image and we just sync the code into the image and we recompile in place. And this way, the compiler cache stays in the container. I sync new source code into the container. It gets recompiled in the container where the compile cache is already, uh, is already present. Of course, the first time without the cache, it takes a bit longer, but subsequent times are gonna be uh, pretty snappy. So let's test that. And I'm calling this a hot reloading the source code, and I could add in parentheses into uh, a permanently running container. Um, and quick note about hot reload. So every app calls this functionality something different. So Tilt calls it live reload. I used Garden a lot in the past. That's why I call it hot reload. If you're gonna use Scaffold, it's called Filesync. So just so you know, it has a billion different names across different tools. Um, so what do we have to do for this? Uh, here in the, in the Docker build function, and by the way, this whole view here is kind of scary, but this is just a diff. So I have the new file here and the old file here. And it's not as complicated as it looks. It's just because it's two files side by side. So I have my Docker build function um, on my tilt file, which is where I, I told it, hey, there's a glitch service. Uh, here's the Docker file. Here are the files, blah, blah, blah. So I add the new function here. And this is, of course, built in into tilt. You don't have to write any of these functions yourself. I say, we're going to do live update. And we're going to sync the glitch directory uh, on localhost with the glitch directory inside the container. And then it's just gonna watch the files. When I change something locally, it's gonna update the file remotely. Um, of course, I'm gonna need something different too, because if I have a container and it's running a binary, 
and I change some source code file inside that container, nothing's gonna happen because who cares? So I need a tool like Enter, and what Enter is gonna do is it's gonna monitor my file system uh, for changes, and when something changes, it's going to run something. So here I'm telling Enter, hey, uh, watch all the Go files in my, in my source code directory. Whenever you find one, you're gonna reload uh, the stuff that you're running, uh, and you're gonna recompile and reload the new binary. So you can look into this stuff if you want, uh, or you can ask me questions, but let's just assume it works for now and move on. So here's what it looks like. I press update and boom, right there, two seconds, point three. So this is a lot faster. And now we're in the order of magnitude of that tweet that I showed you in the beginning. So mission accomplished, but we're not gonna stop here. So it took an average two seconds on a local cluster, 2.5 seconds on a remote cluster. So something to observe on the remote cluster is that now you are syncing a file that is a few, kilo, a few kilobytes in size. You're syncing source code. You are not syncing, you are not having to um, upload huge Docker images. Uh, you're not having to upload like big bunches of stuff. Um, you are basically syncing a few kilobytes at a time, and that's why it's so much faster. So um, locally, I'm now on 8% of my initial time, and remotely, I'm on 4%. So this is huge, and this is amazing. We could end the talk here because we got our objective, but there are caveats. So um, issues. One is that the images generated here, because you are compiling stuff inside the container, you need your tooling inside the container. And in production, sometimes you don't want that. You would rather have an image that is as tiny as you possibly can, and you don't want the whole Go tool chain inside the image. So maybe this is gonna create a development environment that is too different from your production environment. That can be a problem. Also, because you are compiling inside the container, that container needs CPU and memory enough to compile that binary. And if you have two services, maybe that's fine to have very powerful containers. If you have 50, then every service is gonna be very lean and it's gonna have very little compute and very little memory. And you don't want every service to have too much compute available. So that's gonna be a problem. And let me show you the problem. So attempt five and a half, we're gonna do our hot reload, blah, 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 but with only half a CPU and let's see how long this takes. So I'm updating my uh, Kubernetes manifest and I'm saying, hey, uh, use half the CPU you were using before. And I'm not gonna show you uh, because it took a long time um, and it's not interesting, but locally with half a CPU, it took four seconds as opposed to two, so a lot longer. On a remote cluster, uh, just for kicks, I tested it with 10% CPU and it took 16 seconds. Um, so that is way too much, that's unacceptable. Uh, this was the case with this service. Sometimes it fails when it runs out of memory too, so that's something to keep in mind. And that is the reason that this uh, hot reloading the SARS code approach is not my favorite. It's because when it works, it's amazing. But if you need to compile stuff, um, sometimes it doesn't. So let's move on. And as you can see, with limited uh, compute, it took a lot longer than before. So how can we fix this? What's a way where we don't depend on our containers being powerful? So what if instead of syncing source code into the container and compiling in the container, what if I compile locally and then sync the resulting binary into the container? And then the container doesn't need any tooling in there because it's not gonna compile anything. It doesn't need uh, memory or CPU, extra memory and CPU for compilation, it only needs what it's gonna actually need at runtime. So that's gonna solve those two problems. So let's try that and see what happens. Uh, and by the way, this is possible in some languages and not possible in some. So with Go, it's very easy. Let's say you're running Windows locally, you can very easily create a binary that runs on Linux. So that's fine, but sometimes that's not gonna be possible. Once again, like I said, I'm doing what's possible with my language of choice. If my language of choice is different, I need to explore different uh, avenues. Um, by the way, before I move on, you're gonna run into this problem if you try to do this. Um, if you compile something 
locally with Go and you put it in an Alpine container, there's going to be an issue because usually if you're running Linux, you have the, the uh, GNU or however you pronounce that, GNU, I don't know. You have the new uh, C library on your computer uh, that comes with your Linux distro. Alpine uses a different C library. So you need a static binary. If it's calling any C libraries, any external C libraries, and with Go, if you're using anything over the network by default, you're using external C libraries, it's gonna fail. And the error is gonna be this, which makes no sense. And it's gonna take you a very long time to figure out what the hell is going on. And then you're gonna do C go enabled equals zero. And what that does in effect is create a static binary. So just so you know. Uh, now back to the scary screen with the diff. And again, this is the previous version of my tilt file. This is the new version of my tilt file. So that step when I was um, creating the timestamp for my benchmark, now I'm also going to um, do one, one more thing in this step. So I'm adding the, I'm adding the timestamp for the benchmark and I'm compiling it locally. So whenever I click uh, update on my uh, dashboard, I'm going to change the, the timestamp and I'm going to recompile locally. I'm not compiling in container anymore. And by the way, if you are using Tilt or any of those other tools, this thing that's on the screen right now, this is not best practices. I'm doing this just for demonstration purposes. You will not do this yourself um, for real, just so you know. Um, now on the tilt file, uh, the main difference here is that instead of syncing my whole glitch directory where I have all the source code, I'm just syncing a binary uh, and basically that's it. That's the only file I'm gonna have in my, in my container is this binary and that's all I'm syncing, no more syncing source code. <clears throat> and on my Docker file, uh, instead of copying a directory, again, I'm just copying a binary and instead of watching for changes on the source code and recompiling, I'm just watching for changes on one file, which is the binary, and I'm rerunning just that one binary. Uh, and a very notable difference here, I needed all my Go tooling to compile stuff in the container. Now I don't. Now I have an Alpine container, which is insanely smaller. Uh, if you're familiar with this, you're aware. So now I click update and boom, there you go. Took me two seconds. So uh, on average local cluster 1.8 seconds, this is the fastest so far on a remote cluster 9.9. .9. Now this is not the fastest anymore. So um, locally, this is the best way, this is the fastest way. Uh, remotely, uh, the hot reloading the source code is the fastest. And the reason of course is that here I was syncing a, a text file source code and here I'm syncing a binary and Go binaries can get pretty big. So that, that takes some overhead. But there's something we can do about that. Let's try something else. So right now, um, my bottleneck is the size of the binary. So let's address that. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that you can compress binaries. Uh, they think that, oh, it's uh, what comes out of the, the compiler's machine code. So it's already optimized and compressed. And when I send files over the network, the packets are uh, gun zipped, so they're already as small as they can be, and nope, you're wrong. Uh, so let me show you why. You can use a tool like UPX uh, to compress your executables, and let's see what it does. So here, um, this is my update file, the, the one that adds the timestamp and recompiles. So here I'm just adding a step. So I'm compiling to a big binary, I use UPX to make a smaller binary, and then I sync that smaller binary. And this is the fastest mode, by the way. You can make it compress more. Um, you can make it make the binary even smaller. Uh, but here I decided to go for speed and not for uh, you know, the smallest as possible because at some point the trade-off is not worth it. So when we update, um, let's take a look. And it took 3.8 seconds locally, uh, but let's go up a little bit. And we can see that we had a 40%, uh, our file is 40% smaller, and that's gonna be significant. So locally average 3.1 seconds, so it took longer. Uh, remotely six seconds, so that's shorter than before. Now, 
let's take a look at the, the final tally. So um, with uh, compiling locally and syncing the binary, it's 1.8 seconds. Um, and that's the fastest uh, workflow that I can get. And this is what we at Tilt are recommending everyone to do when they're using Go. If I wanna use this approach against a remote cluster, this is gonna be my best, compressing the binary. Um, and this is where I mentioned that removing those debugging artifacts from the binary made a big difference. Because um, if we still had that debugging information here, uh, this would be a lot longer and every megabyte counts. So by compressing the binary and removing debugging information, um, we're getting this down to an acceptable time. So I would say six seconds is okay, is acceptable, but it's not the best you can do. And in this case, if you're, uh, if you're using a remote, so here there are some conditions, right? If you're using a remote cluster um, and you have compute on the container that you're working on uh, to do the compilation quickly, and it's not a problem to have the compilation tooling inside the image, then you should use this. If any of those are a problem, then you should use this. And this is also okay. Um, now this is Go and it's a compiled language. So you're probably thinking, but I use Python or I use Node. Compilation is not, doesn't exist. So what's the best? Uh, then you should just stick to this one for both cases. Uh, because if you're not compiling, then just hot reload the source code into a live uh, running, uh, uh, into a permanently running container, let's say, uh, and just, uh, just sync the source code and that's gonna be better. And we have examples on tilt.dev if you wanna look into how to do that. So this is the final result. Um, and then of course my recommendations are uh, compiled language running locally, use this. And I I'm just repeating myself. Um, if you have a, a dynamic language, use this. Um, and of course, all those trade-offs that I talked about if it's a compiled language and you're using a remote cluster. So um, this, is, this is basically the end of the talk. This is what I had to show you. Uh, some things, if you wanna take this further, we didn't explore scratch containers. They're gonna be more efficient than Alpine containers, but they bring in more headaches. So that's something you might wanna do. Uh, and if you like this idea of optimizing container images uh, probably farther than you should, then you should check out Jerome Pipizzoni's blog series, uh, Reducing Image Size. It's great. He knows more about this stuff uh, than I ever will. So definitely check it out. Uh, thanks for coming here and feel free to get in touch. Um, email, Twitter, uh, Slack, anything uh, you want. And thanks again. And if we have questions, we can get to them. All right, thank you very much, Al. Uh, we don't have any open questions right now, uh, but I think it's also fair to say if we were at a conference, then mm -hmm. there'd be applause at this point. Uh, but maybe since we're not in that and we're online mm -hmm. instead, uh, perhaps a couple of people can drop a bit of applause, let's say, into the <laughs> chat, um, if you've enjoyed it. Um, I actually jotted down a couple of questions, if you don't mind mm -hmm. me sure. asking. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not a developer per se, but maybe I have some, something interesting to say. Um, you showed lots of techniques to speed up the deployment. Mm -hmm. um, are there any situations where slower deployments actually make sense? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, sometimes you are going to have a slower deployment time because that's just how it is. Uh, so depending on how much stuff is in your container, or let's say you're using Java, those traditionally take a long time to spin up. Um, those kinds of things, then they are going to take longer. But even then, you always, like from the point of view of a developer, you always want that feedback loop to be as small as possible. There is no... I have never come across a good reason to make it take longer. Okay. Well, that's a pretty straightforward answer then to my question yeah. there. Um, and is there one rule that has no exception when it comes to deploying as fast as possible? No, you it's say, basically, no. it's like the rule of life. Do you want more headaches or less headaches? I always want less headaches. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, and we've got some comments in the chat now. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, if uh, there's nothing else you'd like someone, to say. 
Someone said something about Java on the chat. Uh, just so you know, we have a guide for Java on our website. So if you if you want to explore this, uh, you can just go straight there, and it has some Java specific stuff that I'm not that familiar with, but probably going to make sense to you. All right. Then with that, I think uh, we're all done here. So thank you very much, Al, and thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for having me.